Hi folks, welcome back to the PocketGamer.biz podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Baglow, and joining me as always is the effervescent Peggy Ann Saltz. Hi, Peggy. Hey, Brian. Great to have you back, literally, because you've been away. You've been away, and you'll tell us about that maybe a bit more, but... Um... Yeah. What was the yes. biggest surprise? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, so I, I should explain uh, to the listeners. I've, I'm just back yes. from a, a week in Australia. I was asked to go out and speak at the Electric Dreams Conference, which is part of the Adelaide Fringe, um, which is the second largest arts festival in the world after Edinburgh, where I am, oddly enough. So it was totally jaw dropping. It's the number of people out there, the number of interactive events and performances um, that were using games, tools or tech or, or just drew from the world of games was absolutely astonishing. So I'm back revitalised, re-energised and absolutely willing to embrace the future of games as a transformative technology. That is awesome. I can feel the energy, Brian. I really can and see it in your face. And it's great that you're talking about transformation because that is happening everywhere in entertainment and in games and with AI. So what better way than our guest today, right, Brian? He is a pioneer in this. He's Guy Gadney, co-founder and CEO of Charisma Entertainment, hugely impressive, long track record, working in this in entertainment products such as BBC, Sky, Penguin Books, Fox. He's produced Emmy and BAFTA nominated products for drama and factual television series. And hey, we connected him. I at least got to connect with him, but he was at Pocket Gamer uh, in London as well, speaking there, talking about creativity in and around the world. So hey, let's welcome you, Guy. <laughs> Great to be here. And you're just getting ready to go to South by Southwest where creative worlds collide, amazing things happen. What are you excited about? What's going to what's going to be the topic or the uh, focus for Charisma there? You know what? It's all driven around the lampposts. It's what the flyers are that are being put around the lampposts in town. So, for example, last time I was at South by Southwest, did the same trip before. South by Southwest, all of the lampposts had these flyers around metaverse, so-and-so in the metaverse, you know, celebrity in the metaverse, metaverse, metaverse. The lampposts in GDC had nothing. You know, there was not about metaverse. It was about other sort of technologies. Um, and I found that fascinating. And that, the, that sort of the, you know, those traffic lights. So, you know, uh, posters and, and so forth are, I think, very reflective of two different angles and two different industries right now. Um, South by Southwest, as you know, I mean, it's, it, it started out in, uh, in, in music and then evolved to film. And then now it's tech, which is this sort of the, the, the dominant, um, content strand really for that. But I think across both, if I was to make a prediction and it's a fairly, um, I think a fairly easy prediction to make is, is it's going to be AI and what the implications are for it. I think still, there are a lot of question marks. It's a very broad technology AI. It touches everyone from sort of candlestick makers through to games developers, through to film producers, writers, um, farmers, you know. So I think the um, the landscape is going to be fascinating to have that discussion. I can't wait. You're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's one of these... Um... It's always it's always nice to sort of predict the trends based on who's advertising and what they're advertising at any of the major events. And, and South by Southwest has always been the one that's that I've used as a bit of a bellwether because they do bring together all these different sectors. And and it's you know I think for me that that's the most exciting part is it's not just game development, game creation, but it's how games as a transformative technology is impacting the wider creative world. And then, you know, the use of AI within that, it, it's the possibilities are almost limitless. And, you know, that's the problem, actually, is that the possibilities are, you know, so broad um, that the discipline almost is working out what to do with it. And I remember thinking a while back that in some ways AI is the cause, but the effect is automation. So rather than looking at AI and thinking, hmm, what can I do with AI? Now think about yourself in terms of automation and which parts of the self can we automate? Which parts of production of, 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 um, 
of our lives can be automated. Sorry to jump in, Guy, but just tell us a little more about Charisma, just so we, we know kind of what the, what the company's up to and what it's focused on. Yeah, so I think in that spirit and, and, and building off that concept of automation, what we realized early on is that as, as games developers and our interactive storytellers want to create more immersive stories, so they become slightly more complicated to write. It's not a question of writing it in Microsoft Word or indeed a movie script in Final Draft. You have to contemplate, you know, some element of branching narratives or characters that evolve that, you know, uh, adapt based on player input over time. And that's quite complicated. So what we realized was that by looking at that storytelling process, that creative, um, I suppose, ideation of how to come up with storytelling, good characters, good plot, tense narratives, um, you can then use AI and specifically I can talk about the bits that we use because it's a broad umbrella to um, to automate some of the process, which for us, for example, is the bit of listening to the player. Actually, it's not about writing it at all. So the, 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 the bit that we wanted to look at was, was storytelling, the creation of the story. And the writers still need to have the story, story and write the story. We feel that's very important. However, the bit that Charisma supports with is then simplifying, you know, how to create almost limitless options. So we use AI to sort of backfill some of that, 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 that infinite experience and indeed within the interactive space, listen to what players are, are saying. So, you know, the experiences that we power, for example, you can talk to the characters, talk to the NPCs. If you say something rude to them, they're going to get angry. If you say something nice to them, they're going to like you. And that then changes the relationship that you have with the players that then changes the game, that changes the story. Now, it would be impossible to write that without... Uh, without this sort of AI technology. So that's what we do. Well, it's something very close to my heart. My first role in the games industry was as a writer, um, way back on the original Grand Theft Auto. And, you know, that in itself, it, we didn't even have the, the, the leisure of using uh, Microsoft Office uh, or um, Word. It was Excel, which is not conducive oh, to you poor thing. narrative flow. So... <laughs> I'm really familiar with it, and I notice it in games all the time. You know, it's the the uh, the conversation trees and the sort of the limited choices, and everything kind of comes back to to fixed points, the illusion of choice without real choice. So I absolutely can't wait to see how this this works and see how it really gives gives you that immersion in in some of these games worlds because you can get lost in all of these things, and if you Come ag come up against the same barks, the same you know repetitive phrases time after time. It can really drag you out of of that immersion. So, um, that that is phenomenal, guy. I mean, I th thank you. I mean, I think we've we've got two big proof points coming up. Actually, one is uh, one of the hardest things you <laughs> you guys will know and the audience will know is to is to take a novel like an existing book and adapt it into any medium, whether it's a movie or a TV series or whatever. Doing it into a game is hard enough, but doing it into, into a game where you're pioneering a new form of storytelling powered by AI is a big chunk to bite off. But we had, we bought the rights to John Wyndham's uh, 1952 classic, uh, The Crack and Wakes, and have been working on that and adapting that over the last couple of years. And that, um, that will be launching um, uh, at the London Games Festival at the end of this March. So we, we, we can't wait. You know, it's, a, an, it's, it's about staying true to the art of storytelling, but weaving in these technologies as well and this capability. And Peggy, I think the other thing that's interesting is, is, is to look at the existing art forms and media that exist and see where the parallels are. And we feel a real kinship, for example, with theatre, funnily enough, and immersive theatre specifically, because in those stories, you are, you know, you turn up at an immersive theatre production and you're, you're there, you know, you're in the story, you're shoulder to shoulder with, with the cast. And what you say changes some of the narrative, but you still have to have that throughput because at the end of the day, you know, you've got to go home because the, the, the show's ended. So that balance between agency and interactivity, I, I creatively find fascinating as well.
That's part of what you're talking about when you say you're pioneering new forms of entertainment by casting audiences inside the stories themselves. So we're a part of that, but you're enabling that at Charisma because you have what you call a toolkit for creatives. So the magic happens when designers, when developers can use this, but what, what, is, that, what is that process like? So I, I think, interestingly, the biggest um, stepping stone that, that the writers have to get over or step onto and then off again um, is exactly what you said, which is the concept of casting an audience inside the story. Because we're so used to writing stories where it is a monologue, you know, uh, and it is the, the voice of a sole author that 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 is you know we sit or we sit down at the cinema or at home and we watch this sort of linear experience passively, but as we then start to move into active um, storytelling, it it it's up to the writer to really contemplate what the audience is going to do when they go into these stories. So I think that for me is funnily enough the the, the biggest challenge. But then again, that said, I think. Y- we also find that some writers for this, this is, this is what they were born to do. You know, this is the format that they, they, they want to write in. Certainly for me, you know, Brian used Excel. <clears throat> I remember, remember that, you know, I was writing a uh, serial killer project, interactive one, which was a combination of Excel and Word and mind mapping software. And my God, IBM Watson, you know, to try <laughs> oh, and bring this thing no. to life and, and sort of went through this pit of disillusionment around the whole thing and then thought we can solve this and then you know that was i suppose the genesis moment for 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 charisma to be born it's been in the forefront of my mind uh, given the number of sort of different experiences immersive experiences and so on and it's something that the you know the games world i don't think has has opened itself up to as fully as it as it really could be so it's so interesting that because if you look then over the last couple of years at two of the largest corporate sort of acquisitions really or moves from unity on the one hand and epic and unreal on the other they've been around digital humans you know whether it's epic games launching meta humans or unity acquiring wet digital and ziva dynamics you know these are massive purchases that were made that i think were uh signposts really for where the industry is going to head Part of the challenge of the games industry is that production cycle that might take two, three, four, five years to come through. And if you think that those were probably two years ago, my guess is that by the end of 2023 and in 2024, we're going to see a lot stronger characters, a lot more immersive characters, a lot more responsive characters coming through. And to my mind also, there is a... uh, a quantifiable return on investment that happens from a commercial standpoint, which is, you know, imagine you're, you've just created a game, much like when you worked on Grand Theft Auto. Let's take that as an example. You run through a city and you're running through, you know, these uh, or driving through these, these, these streets. You don't really stop there. You might run past a bar. You see all these characters are going, hey, get out of my way. But with that same amount of investment in character design and world design, you could then have the player stop at a bar and play a game of poker, or negotiate to get into an argument, you know, and that experience can last for three quarters of an hour, an hour. And so you're deeply immersed in an environment, game environment, which has already been built. So there's no extra cost to it, you know. Um, so I think there's a very interesting business model around here, as well as the creative that will emerge as we as we move into 23 and 24. I love how you're forcing me to think this through and uh, and actually unleashing a process where we're saying, at least I'm saying to myself, yeah, I get it. You know, live ops pays huge dividends. This is sort of in that realm. And it's even cooler because live ops, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not very spontaneous. And I'm not co-creating it, but this is like, I'm together with the designer. I'm together in the game. And I am immersed. I am engaged. It's it's almost, I hate to say it, a win-win, Brian, but uh, it feels like it, doesn't it? We might it be on to something does. here. It, it, yeah, it certainly does. You know, it's we've we've had um, a number of conversations. You know, Peggy and I did a, a, an episode about the PGC Connect uh, event in London. And one of the key themes that every, was on the, everybody's lips was, was, of course, AI. But the discussion still 
um, tend towards the, you know, the fear that they're coming for our jobs. And but what you're talking about is is additive, you know. So it's additional. It's it's increasing the complexity. It's giving developers a whole new tool set to deepen that experience, not just automate them out of existence. Oh, hundred percent. And our, our um, I suppose our ethics on this having always been down that track. You know, we want this to be a toolkit. It's a new paintbrush for writers. You know, it's a new it's a new way of doing things, and that new way is is a way which simply would not have been possible without the addition of technology to it. So it's not taking away. You know, it's not taking away from existing writing skills. As I said, as I said before, it, it's 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 sort of matching certain styles of writing and going, oh, thank God, finally, I can write these sorts of stories, you know, these sorts of characters um, and put the characters front and center into into all of them. I saw someone say in a interesting way, they said, AI is not going to take your jobs, but the people who know how to use AI will. And I thought that, <laughs> that distinction was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently gave a talk about sort of the future. Generally, it was a it was a sort of, it was an interesting keynote in in the sense that the the brief was very broad, um, and and I looked again at that concept of automation around things and went back. There was a little spark in the back of my mind, and I, I went back and researched Detroit in the nineteen fifties and what happened to the automotive industry at that period, and. It's fascinating because it wasn't a simple story. It wasn't like, oh, all these guys were put out of work and it was the blue collar thing. Actually, there was a lot of reskilling, retraining, negotiation that happened over a period of years to change the nature of that city into something else. So I, my sense is that, you know, there is an absolutely understandable psychological worry about, you know, one's own essence, one's own jobs and our own, you know, individual views on, on things. But um, at the same time, I think there are a lot of new opportunities that will it, it will create. And I believe, as you said, Brian, that, that it, through pioneering new forms of creativity, you're also enabling new forms of, uh, of revenue streams for creatives. And my God, the creative industry needs it. When you think, you know, the average writer's salary is, professional author is £7,000 a year. It could do with a bit of a boost. But we've got numerous examples of um, really fantastic companies that are creative assembly lines. You know, it's the games industry is absolutely chock a block with with studios who are incredibly efficient at producing what they do. So giving them an entire an entirely new suite of tools, which can mm. deepen the player experience. I think, um, yeah, it's likely to require some reskilling, retraining, maybe a. a slightly different job roles or maybe even completely different job roles but i think it's it, it certainly seems to have a a far greater beneficial side than i think we're discussing at the moment so i think what i'm saying is we need to come to your talk please do i mean i i think uh, it, it, and you know it's the wonderful thing about these sorts of things that you know we we, we have this conversation and then we can carry on the conversations around it i I, I do think the opportunities are there. And and again, like you said, Brian, also picking up your word deepen is important because so many games are about progressing through levels. And indeed, the TV industry, you know, it's, it's what I call horizontal binging. We sit down and we watch episodes one to 10, horizontal binging. What I quite like is the concept of vertical binging. And I think it's applicable both to the games industry and TV where rather than just rush through a game or rush through a series, you stop, you pause, you spend time in that world. Uh, and, and, and if that, if through spending time, you'll get your, you're doing it through meeting good characters and interesting characters, then, uh, then that's good because that's how we emotionally relate to each other. You know, that, that sense of, of relationship, uh, humor, laughing, crying, Jesse Shell, I think, made a, an interesting observation that the language of Hollywood is very above the shoulder. You know, it's 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 uh, make them laugh, make them cry, and yet the language of the games industry is quite below the shel uh, shoulders. It's just running, jumping, you know, uh, action, 
And his view was that actually if those two worlds can come together, we can get more of an emotional um, impact into games and indeed uh, interactivity back up the other way. That's going to be a powerful combination. You have me thinking about that combination. And that's very exciting because you're bringing together, you know, emotion and action. But to unleash this, you're not afraid of it. Based on that, what does a good collaboration with AI look like? How do we unleash this? How are you doing that? How do we as humans do that? It's such an interesting question. And what I always love is that we never had these sorts of philosophical questions 15 years ago in this industry. <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 and, and as, a, as someone who studied philosophy as, you know, at, at university, I, I, I really enjoy um, thinking about these. I think, I, think it's, I think the short answer is, you know, it's up to us, actually, uh, as, yeah. uh, as industries, as humans, as, as, um, as technologists, to work out what we want out of this and to respond in ways that make um, the world a better place. My strong ethical feeling, it's not even ethical, my strong sort of uh, direction is that within this space, who we are as humans is so generated by our creativity, you know, just the way that we communicate, we express, that if we try and automate that, that surely has got to be a bad thing. And if we don't, further than that, if we don't respect that, which is why I have issue with a lot of AI, uh, large big tech companies training their models on copyrighted material and not paying it back to the authors. It seems like a wholly unnecessary redistribution of wealth. Um, so my sense is that is that we are going through this 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 philosophical phase, uh, which in some ways is ex existential, but also is a is a good moment because I hope we we can use this to elevate um, our thinking uh, into a more connected sort of human race. Gosh, that suddenly got very philosophical and very deep very quickly. But you can see but this. I, you know, I love it. Is a, no, is no, important. no, no, Guy, it's great when you do that because it's actually very inspiring. We were talking in prep about this. I mean, guess what? Philosophy and having studied it, which we both did in different ways, has a place, has a place. What does that tell us about the skills that we're going to need or the skills we're going to start to value perhaps as well? You're right, Peggy. I mean, you know, as you said in, in prep, we both discovered that we both had the common ground on on philosophy as a, as, as a study. When I studied it, funnily enough, I was I, I studied it, and it was the last year of philosophy at the university before they were going to shut down the philosophy division. And now you're starting to see it come back as a subject, you know, with a lot of funding, largely I think driven by uh, AI and ethics and these sorts of these sorts of concepts. So I hope that. Um, that we we just think a little bit more about about what we about who we are and what we're doing with the sort of global communications that we now have where everything happens so fast and ideas can be communicated so fast we are almost operating in this hive mind you know i was talking to a writer yesterday about this actually and and i i i fully agree that it, it just changes the way that we think we can't just be these 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 um separated individuals anymore and what that does to us i hope uh, is a sense of collective responsibility that, you know, taps into the major issues we're facing. I think that's that's incredibly interesting. And it and it really kind of speaks to the fact that there's so much more to games than a content type or, or a set of genres or a set of um, experiences. You know, since we um, first connected games to the internet, and, uh, communities have come together. People have discovered new ways of interacting and engaging with each other both positive and negative but it but it really highlights the fact that the games are almost an emergent you know um uh, experience in their own right uh, and i don't think as a sector we've, we've kind of appreciated that one of the real benefits of what you're discussing here uh, with us today is the fact that you can then use ai you can cater for all of the different player types because we know people getting involved with in games for different reasons. You've got completionists, teachers, guides, you know, griefers. So having a tool set that can actually say, okay, 
you're playing it this way, so we're going to give you more of this, you know, really does tailor each person's experience to that individual. So again, I, I just think the potential here is jaw dropping. And, and that's why we've done this as a tool set rather than a product, it, because we always wanted it to be in some ways for Charisma to be a blank canvas onto which people can paint their own pictures. We don't want to say this is just for, just for sci-fi genres, like you're saying, or just for action games or just for narrative games. It's not. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking about something that enables people to do their own thing. And that's, that's, you know, that's quite, um, that's exciting because we get to see what people can create on it. You know, rather, we're not pushing people down a particular pathway. We're saying this is a new way of working like you're saying about connecting to the internet. These are now characters that speak to you, that can react to you. Now what? Go play. What can you do? It's also part of an exciting continuum when you frame it like that, Guy, because I'm thinking, yes, we had content that was highly relevant, personalized, you know, constructed and um, made to be exactly what would match a player type. And now it's going from the aspects of content to the substance of that content, the conversation. So not just the experience, but all the way down into the, the deepest depths of the experience. Now that's got to be exciting. That has to be path breaking. And, and you've done this a bit. Is this what you're doing in your own project? You have electric sheep. Is this coming through in that project? It is. So Electric Sheep, as a, by way of introduction, is a project which we've run almost like an art sideline as an R&D project for us. But we're launching this um, at South by Southwest, uh, which is exciting. We started looking at this just prior to GPT-2. So in other words, just prior to the first real movement forward in generative AI. And Electric Sheep is a, as a get, as an experience. You type in, you know, the dream you might have had last night. And then in 3D, you know, there is an interpretation, a, a, a sort of visualization of that dream where all of the architecture, all the buildings are created in real time. The characters are created in real time, their conversations, their faces, the weather system. Ultimately, there will be music that is created in real time all around that. And for us doing that over the course of the evolution of GPT-2, the introduction of GPT-3, and then chat GPT has been fascinating because some of the things which creatively we wanted to do but couldn't, we now can, which goes to the point of AI not replacing people. We actually had the ideas that were technically not possible. Now we can. That's not replacing. That's 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 allowing us to visualize the, the vision. So that's um, an electric sheep, obviously, is, is a nod back into the book itself. So I think we... Um, we wanted to really push what it, what the experience could feel like, um, and watch the space. It's a dreamy, slightly trippy um, experience, but you know, I hope we get a couple of games companies looking at going. Oh my God! Look what they just did. That's a, uh, that's that's interesting. You know, Brian, you were at Electric Dream, so you also saw you know worlds collide, creative worlds bump, connect. How do you see this? And how do you see what he's talking about? I mean, is this inspiring a new generation of game designers and de developers as we as we speak? What do you see as the as the impact that you saw there and the connection with what Guy is talking about? I think there's a there's an enormous connection, and I think it it could be truly transformative because one of the most exciting things was um, many of the shows, many of the performances were using games, tools, technologies, and, and indeed techniques. Um, but it was not coming from people with a games background. It was coming from people with a screen background or a film, uh, excuse me, theatre or performing arts background. So as soon as you get the tools into the hands of people um, in other areas with different backgrounds, different visions, then strange and wonderful and, and unique things can happen. So. One of the biggest issues uh, that, that kind of came out of the event I was at, at Electric Dreams, was um, for a lot of the performers, a lot of the, the companies that uh, were trying to do something, they ran headlong into the developer problem. We need a developer. We need a technologist. And then translating between their vision and then the, the you know, the programmer developer's 
um, understanding of what that was caused problems. And and so I see this as as absolutely giving the the tools and the ability to create new things, even if it's just prototypes that then go to a, a developer, a development team. Um, I see this really kind of pulling down the walls between all the different areas of our creative world. You know, I'm absolutely down with this whole future thing. Um, and I can't wait to see uh, the crack and wakes. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of John Wyndham's and I, I can imagine how this would translate. So, um, yes, and I may be having a, a, a bit of a play with electric sheep um, later on this afternoon as well, Guy. I guess my my uh, my last question for you, Guy, is um, outside yourselves, is are, are there any projects out there where you think, yes, that's that's a great example of how AI can be used, how it can, you know, really demonstrate the, the, the possibilities and the potential that you can maybe point people towards? Because there's a, a lot of um, bloviation, shall we say, there's a lot of kind of speculation out there, but can you sort of point to anything that we can share with the, the listeners, the viewers, the audience um, that you think is actually pretty good? Gosh, so the projects that come to mind around, you know, characters in in games and games in, in this space are not necessarily, I can't necessarily think of titles that have used AI but I can think of titles that would have been so much better if they had, you know, and I, I cite Red Dead Redemption 2 as well, you know, an incredible game, you know, uh, emotional, engaging, just wonderful. But I wanted more, I wanted to be able to spend more time with the characters and and, and know them better. Um, so I would have loved, I would have loved that from, from there. GTA also, um, any, I think any game which is has an element of narrative in it. Uh, the work that Annapurna publishes is is astonishing. Back to her, and back to her story and and things like that. I always liked Last of Us. Obviously, you know the, the, those sorts of narrative titles with very strong, um, very strong characters. I think AI Dungeon was possibly the first, you know, um, significant play in in in, in generative AI and. You know, or that's probably the, the the number one piece at the moment that that I've seen. You know, there's so much more that I think people will do in the, in the next near future. Well, who knows? You know, maybe we'll see a new generation of remastered classics coming out that do have, the, you know, the AI backing to to really, you know, yeah. give them a, a whole new depth. I love that idea. And that would fit with the whole trend to nostalgia's in night, right? You know, talking about going back, let's imagine that uh, we meet again. You know, we meet again together. And Guy, you come and you're telling us, hey, you know, I've got great news. I've got something I want to tell you. Maybe even brag a little bit to us. What do you want to be telling us about yourself, about charisma, about the state of AI in games? So revealing a bit of my prime uh, objective uh, from Robocop world, people listening were fans of the X-Files series when it was on. Great series, Mulder Scully, all of that good stuff. Right at the end of every episode, after the credits had rolled, there was a little sort of hand-drawn animation of a typewriter and someone typing and then the paper flew out and a kid's voice went, I made that. And it's that, that piece. That piece. I want to be able to come back to you guys and, and say, you know, that thing you were just talking about. I made that. You know that 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 that's exciting to me. Also, the same coin. I think uh, I would love people to. I would love to be able to look at charisma as I already do, and I look at the worlds and the, the people and the stories and the and, the, and the, the projects that people create on charisma and say they made that. Look what they did with this. Look how they pushed it in ways I hadn't thought of. They've made me laugh. They've made me cry. They've brought these characters up up onto screen uh, in ways I hadn't possibly imagined. I think that that's what I would would love to be able to show. I'd love to be able to show other people's work, funnily enough, more than my own, even though that's my motivation. I'm going to bring things to a close um, by first of all saying thank you, Guy. It has been no, an extraordinary 
interview. I think we've both um, <laughs> come away. We might need to sit with a bag of frozen peas in our heads and just kind of <laughs> let that all percolate for a while. So we, we have two questions that we tend to ask guests. Uh, so the first is, what's your favourite game of all time? And the second is, and what are you playing right now? There was a there was a moment where I was motorbiking around Spain and I pulled into a small bar in a tiny little roadside village, and I went into the bar and ordered a coke because it was it was a hot day, and in the corner there was an arcade machine, and it was R Type, which was my favourite game, Ooh. and mm-hmm. I looked there and there was the same name in the top I can't remember I think it was the top five list same name same letter same three letters. And I could see his score and I thought, I can do better than this. And I put in my coin and I played and I could see, I could feel that he was in the bar, feel it. And I looked across and I could see him like, he's still going, he's still going, he's still going. And then I, and then, and then I got to number one on the leaderboard. So I'll type that. <laughs> um, right now, like I'm afraid from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, I'm everything is uh, we're, we're, we're play testing the crack and wakes we're play testing electric sheep so I'm going to discount those and say I actually like words with friends to wind down <laughs> it's a casual game yes. but just every now and again words with friends um is 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 my guilty pleasure can't believe you're saying it right the now. Closet here. We, we, <laughs> no. Maybe we can come out of the closet here, I think, a little bit. <laughs> Brian, you probably have some sort of guilty pleasure as well. Oh, listen, I'm a, I'm a huge Words with Friends fan. It's uh, I'm going to go on, on, on into the public record right now and say my mum is cheating, but I love her. <laughs> There's no way she's not getting some of these. But um, love you dearly, mum, but I'm on to you. <laughs> so not even a remotely guilty pleasure. I'll shout it from the rooftops. But um, that that sadly has to bring us to an end of things. Uh, Guy, again, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on, sharing. And we will take that step forward into the future and see if we can bring you back and and see exactly how many things you can say, I made that or they made that. I'd love to do that. Real pleasure. Look forward to it. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for listening. And thank you. Thank you both for, for, uh, for the discussion. Fantastic. I have to second that guy. Thanks so much. And it is a date. We are going to do this. And in the meantime, (laughs) Brian and I are going to check out Electric Sheep as well. So we will indeed. Thank you. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market in all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz. And you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. (laughs)